At 6.43 a.m. on March 1, 1943, 19-year-old, mathematician Janet Patricia, Ockel stood frozen in the dim, cold basement of Derby House, a room that had transformed from a neglected storage space into the nerve center of Britain. Most critical wartime experiments? The chalked grid beneath her feet, still fresh from the simulation she had completed minutes earlier, resembled a battlefield etched in quiet lines and symbols. As she stared at the pattern she had created, something inside her hollowed out. The path she had plotted the timing of the attacks. The precise moments where the convoy's defenses collapsed all matched to perfection. The real disaster that had taken her brother's life just 48 hours earlier. For eight relentless months, with no formal military title or authority, armed only with chalk, a stopwatch, and wooden counters representing ships. She had been mapping the unseen rhythms of the Battle of the Atlantic. And in those months, she had discovered what seasoned admirals would not admit that the Royal Navy's long-established tactics were catastrophically out of date. And every day they remained unchanged meant the loss of more ships, more cargo, and more lives. Two days earlier, on February 27th, Janet had received the telegram that would alter her world forever. The message was brutally short, stripped of comfort or hope, HMS Hesperus, lost with all hands. Convoy SC-121, torpedoed, no survivors. Her brother Thomas, only 23 years old, had been among the dead. He served as a destroyer officer specializing in anti-submarine operations, and in one of his final letters he had confided a grim suspicion. Something wrong. The U-boats know what we're going to do before we do it. The tragedy that consumed convoy SC-1-1 proved him right. The convoy 59 merchant ships guarded by nine escorts had left. Halifax following the exact operational patterns prescribed by doctrine. On February 24th, under the cover of darkness, a wolf pack of U-boats found them. The escorts responded exactly as the manuals instructed, chase the threat, pursue aggressively, and attempt to destroy the submarine. But every physical chase created a gap, and every gap was swiftly exploited. By dawn on February 26, 13 ships were lost. More than 70,000 tons of supplies were gone. Six escorts were damaged, and HMS Hesperus Thomas's ship was struck while chasing a submarine that had already slipped away into the vast blackness of the Atlantic. The destroyer broke apart, sinking so rapidly that no one escaped. Janet had already predicted this pattern in her simulations. It's the same errors, the same fatal reactions, the same blind spots. It was a tragedy she had mapped long before it occurred. In the months leading to her brother's death, Janet had run eight different simulations that reproduced the very scenario that destroyed SC-121, and every single one ended in disaster. In each exercise, the escort commanders did what they had been trained to do, pursue the submarine, and each time the U-boats acted not as isolated hunters, but as coordinated predators. When one submarine surfaced, it was almost always a lure to draw escorts away from their primary duty protecting the convoy. Each pursuit widened the defensive perimeter, exposing the soft center, and each time the wolf pack slipped into these vulnerabilities, picking off helpless merchant ships with ruthless efficiency. She submitted warnings to Captain Roberts, who supported her analysis, and together they sent formal reports to the Admiralty. The replies came back steeped in skepticism and tradition. Senior officials insisted simulations could not represent real combat and dismissed. The work done by young girls with no sea experience. To them, the doctrine was sacred, unshakable, a legacy handed down through generations of naval power. Admitting that a teenage civilian had uncovered fatal flaws in their strategy was simply unthinkable. When Janet received the telegram about Thomas, she had been in the middle of another war game, this time facing Lieutenant Morrison. She had already broken through his screen using tactics drawn from actual German patterns when Captain Roberts stepped into the pit and quietly handed her the message. He gently told her she could take the rest of the day to grieve, but Janet, without shedding a tear, walked back to the massive floor map and continued the simulation. With a calm, almost surgical precision, she demonstrated how Morrison's adherence to outdated doctrine exposed his convoy and led to its destruction. When he challenged her conclusions, claiming she did not understand real combat, she looked at him and asked, How many convoys have you lost? After a long silence, he admitted to losing four. Janet then told him, in a voice barely above a whisper, 
My brother died in the fifth. Two days ago, the room fell silent. Even Morrison had nothing left to say. Grief did not stop her, and instead it fueled a determination that bordered on unbreakable. The simulation room nicknamed The Pit was a damp, echoing basement space with leaking pipes and concrete walls stained by time. It bore no resemblance to the dramatic naval battles raging across the Atlantic. Yet the fate of Britain's survival was being decided within those unremarkable walls. A thirty-foot floor map represented nearly a kilometer of ocean dotted with markers that told stories of life and death. White markers symbolized escorts, black represented the silent threats of U-boats, and red markers indicated merchant ships already lost. By early 1943, the red markers were multiplying faster than Britain could replace them. February alone had brought the sinking of 63 ships. The destruction of more than 300,000 tons of essential supplies and the deaths of over 2,000 sailors. Britain was bleeding at sea. If the losses continued at this rate, fuel reserves would be exhausted by midsummer. Food stocks would collapse by autumn, and by 1944 Britain might no longer be able to sustain the war effort. The problem was not the bravery of the sailors, nor the resources of the navy, but the deeply ingrained doctrine that had governed British naval operations for nearly two centuries, attack always, defend never against surface fleets, this mindset had once been effective. Against the stealthy, coordinated U-boat wolf packs of the Atlantic, it was nothing short of disastrous. Janet had joined the Western Approaches Tactical Unit WATU in July of 1942, selected not for naval experience, but for her extraordinary talent in mathematics and pattern recognition. Captain Roberts deliberately recruited women for the simulations because they lacked the rigid, ingrained habits that male officers had absorbed through traditional naval training. The purpose was clear, to think like the enemy and uncover the hidden logic behind the German attacks. Janet quickly emerged as one of the most brilliant minds in the unit. In her very first war game, she demonstrated to the shock of a decorated commander that current British escort tactics contained a lethal flaw. Within 43 minutes, she had sunk half his convoy using actual U-boat behavior retrieved from captured documents. When the commander accused her of engineering a biased scenario, Roberts retrieved real battle reports reports that aligned almost perfectly with Janet's simulation. She had no rank, no medals, no sea experience, yet she possessed a keen, unfiltered perspective that the Navy desperately needed but had never asked for. Her insights weren't born from tradition, they were driven by numbers, logic, and a clear-eyed understanding of patterns. Between July 1942 and February 1943, WATU conducted 473 formal war games. The outcome of each was consistent and undeniable. When escorts charged after U-boats, defensive gaps opened. Wolf packs exploited these openings, and convoys were massacred. Despite this mountain of evidence, the Admiralty clung stubbornly to its doctrines, labeling the simulations to unconventional and the analysts to inexperienced but the disaster of Convoy SC 1-1 to -1 shattered any illusion that the old methods were working. When Janet studied the casualty list on March 1st, she analyzed the battle not as a grieving sister, but as a strategist. She reconstructed every maneuver on the floor map, the timing of the attacks, the reaction of the escorts, the fatal decisions that matched her predictions in chilling detail. Captain Roberts found her not crying, but recalculating, preparing to do what no one else had dared, confront the system head-on. Janet realized there was only one man with the authority to rewrite. British naval doctrine, instantly the formidable Admiral Sir Max Horton, commander of the entire Western approaches. Horton was a legend, former submarine commander, famed for his aggressive instincts and ironclad belief in relentless action. K. Okay, challenging his methods seemed impossible. Yet Janet insisted that, if he could be brought into the pit, she could prove everything. Against expectations, Horton agreed to witness a demonstration. On the morning of March 3, 1943, he arrived at Derby House and, with full confidence, insisted on commanding the escort group himself. Janet and her colleague Jean Laidlaw took command of six simulated U-boats. The battle began with Horton applying every tactic outlined by the manual wide patrols, aggressive search patterns, immediate pursuit of enemy contacts, but Janet anticipated each reaction. She exposed a submarine deliberately, and Horton took the bait peeling off two destroyers and opening a fatal gap. Jean slipped through the opening. Torpedoes fired. 
Red counters began to spread across the convoy. Janet surfaced again. Horton chased again. More gaps formed. More red counters appeared. By 10.01 a.m., the battle ended. Seventeen merchant ships lost. None of the U-bots destroyed. Horton stared at the wreckage scattered across the floor map, realizing that his trusted doctrine had failed him. After a long, heavy silence, he said the words that rewrote the future of the Atlantic War. This works. Train every commander. From that moment forward, the Western Approach's tactical unit became the beating heart of strategic transformation. Horton ordered all escort commanders to undergo WAT training without exception. Between March and July 1943, more than 2,500 officers stepped into the pit. Many arrived skeptical, dismissive, or even insulted at the idea of learning from civilians. Yet most left with a newfound respect for the simulations and for the young women who operated them. They learned new doctrines such as raspberry, beta search, pineapple, and step-aside tactics that saved countless ships and thousands of lives across the Atlantic. These strategies, crafted from chalk lines and mathematical insight, were the tools Britain desperately needed. Among the officers, Janet gained a nickname whispered with a mix of awe and respect, the killer, not because she defeated them unfairly, but because she revealed, with stark clarity, the fatal assumptions they carried into battle.